views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the Boogie Down Bronx. If you see that behind me, welcome to the Bronx. And our first panelist is none other than Dr. Oxides Barbo, our Health Commissioner of the City of New York. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you, thank you, Borough President Diaz. Es un honor estar aquí con usted y con la comunidad. It's an honor to be here with you today and the community. Uh, and I want to thank you for hosting this important panel and this series, um, and really for all of the work that you've done and being such a huge advocate for the Bronx, not only during COVID, but obviously through all of the efforts um, that have taken place in the last couple of years. And before I introduce the panel, I just want to talk a little bit about what we have been um, doing through the COVID response specific to the Bronx and really in collaboration with you and your support and that of community leaders in the Bronx. And, you know, as you have stated, um, we recently did a pop-up testing site uh, in Tremont. And, you know, that was uh, for a number of different reasons. First and, for, first and foremost, we realized that during this COVID response, there isn't a one size fits all response that's gonna help all communities. And that we have to take into consideration the various needs that there are in communities so that we can help all of our communities remain safe during this time. And the testing that took place in 10457 um, is one I think that really highlights the point that we use our data to inform the response. And it, this Tremont community was one where we knew that not a lot of people were getting tested, but the ones that were getting tested, a high percentage of them were being positive. And so we worked with um, community members, community partners, uh, and we got a more granular sense of what it would have taken to make sure that we reached everyone that needed to be reached. And to cut a long story short, we worked with health and hospitals, we worked with St. Simon's uh, Church, and we worked with all of our partners to set up a testing station, not only at St. Simon's, but also at H&H's Third Avenue location. And with those rapid testing sites, we were able to test over 2,500 people, um, a lot of folks, and the most important part of it is we got results back, as you said, quickly. We were able to uh, link individuals who had positive results with services to make it easy for them to isolate safely at home, whether it was food, whether it was access to hoteling because they lived in a household where there were a lot of other people and they couldn't isolate safely. All of those things would not have been possible without the partnerships that the health department and your office have been cultivating for years. And, you know, this work doesn't happen overnight. And a lot of this work, I'm really proud to say, was shepherded by Dr. Jane Bedell. And, you know, as many people on this uh, conference know, she led our Bronx office for over a dozen years, I think it was. And during that time, really uh, worked tires, tirelessly to cultivate the types of relationships that allow us to do the work in partnership with community, not going in and telling people what they need to do, but doing it collaboratively. So I think that that's a great segue for me to be able to introduce our panelists and to start with Dr. Jane Bedell, and even though many of us think that she's someone who doesn't need an introduction, I'm going to do one nonetheless. Um, and as I said, Jane was 
Up until recently, the assistant commissioner of the Bureau of Bronx Neighborhood Health and, you know, was known affectionately by any by many of us as Bronx's doctor. And she's been a fierce, uh, dedicated advocate for addressing health disparities in the Bronx and her unmatched ability to spark fruitful collaborations, bring community members together really has been central to our ability to build on her work in what we've been doing for COVID-19. Uh, and even though, I mean, believe it or not, Jane officially retired in February, um, it's like she never left. She has been volunteering for many of our activities in the Bronx, and I really am so thrilled that her life-saving contributions to the Bronx and to New York City are continuing to really bear fruits for us. And so um, I want to also take this opportunity to introduce our other panelists. Dr. Leslie Branch is a racial policy scholar, a Fulbright specialist in race, ethnicity, and religion and politics. And she's a senior research fellow at the Du Bois Bunch Center for Policy at Medgar, Ever Medgar Evers College. She's also a scholar with Scholars Strategy Network and an associate professor at Metropolitan College of New York. Her work examines the gulf between black optimism about group progress and the actual data on continuing disparities. Dr. Branch is the author of Optimism at All Costs, Black Attitudes, Activism, and Advancement in Obama's America. America. And then we also have um, another distinguished panelist, a fellow pediatrician, Dr. Denise Nunez. She's been in practice as a primary care doctor for over 20 years. She's affiliated with the Montefiore Medical Center at the North Divisional Division Hospital and currently cares for patients in the Children's Hospital where she is assistant professor of pediatric crit critical care medicine. She also serves as the medical director and general pediatrician at her thriving Fordham Road patient practice, Divino Nino Pediatrics. And during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in New York City, Dr. Nunez was deployed full-time to care for pediatric and adult patients in the intensive care unit. Today, she will share her views on how the overall health and vulnerabilities of Bronx families determined their outcomes after being infected by coronavirus. And then I also want to acknowledge Dr. Nancy Keck, Director of Health and Human Services in the Bronx, your officer, uh, who will be uh, moderating this session. Uh, and I want to apologize ahead of time that I won't be able to spend the entire time uh, with this distinguished panel, but I look forward to um, their input. And once again, Mr. President, I want to thank you for your commitment to ensuring that um, we don't remain hashtag not 62, that we continue building on the work of communities and leverage what we're doing here in COVID-19 so that now and moving forward, we keep the health of Bronx center as we move this city forward. So thank you, sir. And thank you to the panel. Thank you. Um, I, as all you heard, all of you heard, that's a, a long list of illustrious women, strong women who are out there doing God's work and making sure they were healthy. Um, every so often, if you got, will all permit, I'm going to take some executive privileges and just chiming in. If I hear you say something, maybe a couple of questions uh, before we get to Dr. Bedell, uh, Commissioner. Just a couple of general questions on COVID, being that yes. we were hit so hard. And it's on, obviously on everybody's mind. Um, when, when we did the pop-up shop, that was not only a big hit on that day, but you had, I, we, I had such a huge response from all of the media. And the biggest thing is the fact that we were able to get the results so quickly. So um, question number one, how far are we from, besides what you do, I'm just saying overall as a, as a society being that this is, you know, the, a new day. How far are we from having uh, pop-up shops or getting results in under half an hour so that people can know? I, I, my sister-in-law, uh, she went through like a CVS. I don't want to shout anybody out, but she went through some, you know, some 
some store pharmacy, and um, she had a test nine days ago, and she hasn't received her results. So, you know, whether she's positive, we don't know. If she's negative, fantastic. But let's just say she's positive. That means that she didn't know for nine days, and Lord knows, you know, who she may have infected. So could you just speak on the pop-up and that sort of technology, I guess, or I don't know, that's the, if, for lack of better terms for me, I'm not the health expert. How far away are we from having, you know, more of that happening? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, it's since the very beginning of this pandemic, testing has been our Achilles heel. And it continues to be a particular area of concern um, because not only as a city, but as a country, we're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of having turnaround times that help people make real-time decisions that are going to help to reduce the transmission of this virus. That being said, what we are doing here in the city is we're leveraging different technologies of testing to address that particular need, right? So said differently, we have the regular PCR test, if you will. You know, it was this particular, I think it was this or that nostril that you said, you know, it was the test that was gonna go for the PCR test. Just explain, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, just explain what PCR means for the general public. PCR basically means it's a it's a fancy uh, set of initials that say that mean that it is the definitive way of determining whether or not someone has had or has currently COVID-19. And right now, the most reliable way to get a test is to have that test be done either at a commercial lab or at a lab in a hospital. And the problem that we have here in the city as well as across the country is that there is limited capacity for that testing. And so what that means is if we've got a lot of tests coming in, there's a line that forms backing up the results. And previously we were able to get results in 24 hours and it went to 48. And as you say, there are some places where the results really make take out over a week and it makes the results somewhat meaningless. Right. With that being said, we in this city are utilizing different technologies to try to make that turnaround time faster. What we did in Tremont was to use a test that uses similar technology, but it's not as reliable, and we do it in the field. The challenges there are is that the technology, we can't rely as much on it. So we sometimes get what we call false positives, meaning that someone turns out to be positive. When we do the test at the lab, it turns out to be negative. Conversely, they can also test negative uh, in the field. And then when we send it to the lab, that can be positive. So we're working to see how reliable that ends up being in the long run. The good thing about it though, is that in a community where we have high levels of virus that are still circulating, the chances of a positive in the field being a true positive are going to be much higher. So that's why that test is good in communities where it's, there's high viral load, as we call it. Next part of the testing technology that we are um, rolling out is the testing that we are doing at our uh, public health facilities. So right now at the Chelsea Clinic, we have a machine where it uses different technology to run those same tests. It's as accurate as the traditional PCR. We have one uh, site where we have rolled that out uh, in Corona. We are looking to roll it out in more communities. And the hope is that by in the next couple of weeks, we'll have that in nine different parts of the city. Again, that will give us results in less than 24 hours. And that's what we're looking to get to in communities where there hasn't been uh, high levels of access to testing. There's a high need to ensure that we cut transmission and 
These are communities that have been hard hit by COVID and where there are ongoing inequities and we need to ensure that there's more access to testing. Two quick questions. I could have you here all day, but we obviously got to move on. Um, number one, uh, how, in your expert opinion, um, how far are we from a vaccine, number one, and how concerned are you that a second wave is coming in New York State and New York City? So let me start with the second question first, and then I'll go to the first question. Um, I think it is inevitable that we will have a next phase of increased transmission. Until we get a vaccine or until we get um, definitive medical treatment, we have to assume that we will, especially as the weather changes and people spend more time indoors, that we will have more cases. And so those gives me the opportunity to say two things that if people take nothing else away from this, from what I say, I want them to remember these two things. Until we have a vaccine and definitive medication, face coverings will be a part of our lives. Don't go outside without using a face covering. If you're inside with people that you don't live with, that are people that are outside of your family, wear a face covering. And then the second thing is anybody who thinks that we're gonna test our way out of this pandemic is kidding themselves, right? And that's why making sure that we pay attention to using face coverings, keeping that six feet of physical distancing, staying home if you're sick and getting tested and making sure that you practice good hand hygiene, that's what's gonna get us through this. Thank you. Um, to get to Dr. Bedell before, you say, if, uh, Dr. Bedell, let me just say this. I want, I want to give you your flowers and your roses now. Uh, I, the, I, you know, with all the things and all the people that I encounter, I believe that in life we have two different types of horses. You have a show horse and you have a work horse. And you have always, always proven to be that work horse. For all of the years that I've known you, um, you have been on boots on the ground um, during times of concern, during times of festivities. You've been, inf you've been informative to the people of the Bronx. You were with us when we launched um, Hashtag Not 62. You ride the uh, Tour of the Bronx. And even when you don't do the Tour of the Bronx, anyone could catch you on your bicycle with your, with your helmet. You're always promoting good health. You, you're always speaking out on you know, the issues uh, that, that are unique to the borough of the Bronx. And we appreciate you for that. Uh, Dr. Bedell, from your many years in the Bronx, your team has produced a snapshot of neighborhoods based on an enormous database and health information collected by the DOH and H. How do these measure, how, does, how do you measure the health of a neighborhood? And what are the variables that matter most when we're talking about, you know, the health of an entire community or neighborhood? Thank you, first of all. Uh and great to see you, even if it's not in person. But I did catch you in person as you got tested, which was yes. um, and, and I'm gonna kind of talk about in general terms and in COVID terms, kind of what makes a community healthy? Because that's really the essential question here. Uh, and I wanna thank Nancy and her staff and, and you for supporting this forum. Uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, the forum. My son got an email from a friend of his. Is this your mom? <laughs> uh, he was like, uh, yeah, LOL, as they say. Uh, so there's a lot of interest all over the place. Uh, and I appreciate that because it's such an important time period for all of us. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm a nerd person. I'm gonna share some slides. Um, and I want to thank the people who helped put all of this together. So is this every, is, people are seeing those slides, correct? I can I, see them. I hope everyone else can. Yeah, Chris will, Chris will let me know. So, so let me take, I'm going to take, a trying to look at the clock and take about 12 minutes. So we want to build a healthy Bronx. What, mm -hmm. How do we do that? That's really the essential question that you're asking. How do we do that? What creates health? What makes health? We sometimes do a little exercise with people 
we add, we get a big poster board and some crayons and markers or whatever, and we say, draw a healthy community. So think about that, participants who are here with us today. What would you put in your drawing of a healthy community? And I'll go through some of this and we'll see how it matches up. So first, before we even look at health, let's look at who we are. Who's, who's in the Bronx? This is one set of data, and there's so many different ways to look at who we are. But to look at who we are in these ways, we are overwhelmingly, as you can see, a borough of people of color, Black and Latino, Latinx, uh, and the number and the percentage of, of the white population uh, is dropping. Uh, so we're overwhelmingly people of color. We're a young borough. You see this bar of, of, of youngsters and teenagers is pretty high. Uh, so we're a young borough. About a third of us in this donut-shaped area come from another country. So these are people who came here to the United States, to New York City, but then specifically to the Bronx, to be part of the Bronx and to contribute and, and to grow and to build their families and to grow and to build the Bronx. And a reflection of that is that we have over 90 languages that are spoken right here in the Bronx. So we're a United Nations as well. So that's a little snapshot about who we are. Next thing we might look at and you might think about as you're drawing your picture of what creates health in a neighborhood, in a community, is what kind of assets do we have in our community? So we picked a few, um, not randomly, but just thinking uh, about certain things. So we are, we've been, it's been said that we are the borough of parks and universities, and it does turn out. A lot of people don't believe that. What? <laughs> a lot of people don't believe that about us. But, it's, but look it's, at this data point. That's, that's good. I'm glad you're interjecting. Yes, because almost 90% of us live within walking distance of a park. I live within walking distance of a park where I worked before. I was across the street from a park, and as I bicycled my way uh, from where I live, I passed St. James Park, Echo Park, and Tremont Park. So three parks on my way to work, and it's only a 20-minute bike ride. Uh, so we have a tremendous asset in our parks. Parks are often drawn into people's drawings of what makes a community healthy. Um, we have 35 public libraries. Public libraries are an important institutional resource. I don't happen to know whether 35 is a lot or a little, but I do know that public libraries are hugely important for young people and all ages, uh, and they are across the borough in many neighborhoods. We have over 230 young people who are in public schools. So those students are a resource. The teachers, the staff, the buildings, the basketball courts, the gyms inside, the technology, those are all assets. And then importantly for COVID time, we have over 170,000 frontline workers who are quote unquote essential workers. So we have some tremendous assets and I'm not even including uh, things that we could talk about. How many farmer market, how many corner store bodegas, how many miles of bike lanes, how many institutions of higher learning, et cetera, et cetera. This is one little snapshot um, about health and the Bronx. Then we got to look at some health outcomes. So here's a health outcome. Uh, this one I'm not so happy to report. So this is a map of the whole city. Here's the Bronx. Uh, you know, here's my old office here. Uh, and this is the number of years that a young person, on average, is going to grow up to live to be before he or she dies. And the darker the number, the lower the life expectancy. So I want to draw people's attention to the Bronx, which is only in the dark colors. These other things are parks, by the way, huge, beautiful, fantastic parks, but parks nonetheless. This is all blue and dark blue. That's the lowest life expectancy. Just as a comparison, let's look at Manhattan. Overwhelmingly, the light colors, only two areas, Harlem and East Harlem, that are the dark areas. So if you're a kid growing up in the Bronx, particularly here in the South Bronx, your chances of living a full, complete life are diminished because of things that are going on in your neighborhood. This is not genetic. 
This is not scientifically uh, driven. This is because of the way we've arranged ourselves in society and what assets and resources are there. So this is one snapshot uh, that's important to look at for overall health. You mentioned already that we are the quote unquote sickest county. Uh, I won't dwell too much on that, just to reiterate that uh, this is um, in a very good data-based way. Uh, and this group looks at every county in the country, by the way. So Google county health rankings and you can see it all. Um, and what I want to emphasize, and I'm, I'm hoping this will be a segue in a few minutes to Dr. Branch, that the policies and practices of yesterday are determining the health outcomes of today. The policies and practices of yesterday determine what we see today. Dr. And Rick, one, are we going to yeah. touch a little bit of that with Dr. Branch after you? Because... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. So one thing that we've done a lot of looking at is redlining. Uh, for yeah. people who aren't familiar, this is a redlining map of the Bronx. The areas in red were places where the government, using a racist survey tool, marked off that the conditions were not good because a lot of Black people lived there or a lot of immigrants. Uh, at that time, the immigrants were Italians, uh, and Polish like that, uh, and therefore, we're not gonna give mortgages to people in those neighborhoods. These redlining maps set up policies and practices that real estate businesses profited from and that have left a tremendous legacy uh, today in terms of housing and therefore health. So here's the redlining map of the city, and here's the segregation situation in the city. They're pretty closely paralleled almost 100 years later. So the policies and practices of yesterday are determining the outcomes of today. And COVID is exactly a case study of this. We have these past practices and policies and laws that are in place, and we have the inequity there, an emergency happens, and seemingly all of a sudden, uh, we start seeing things that I guess surprised some people. I want to say in public health, I, I the big, think the, the was big a epiphany, the big epiphany around yes. COVID. By God, you know, marginalized communities, the Bronx, parts of Brooklyn. Like we knew this all along, right? It's just that exactly. COVID, COVID has just put a spotlight on it. But go ahead. We're, yeah, we're, a, a spotlight and maybe and maybe some fuel to some fires that are there, right? Because yep. uh, we're going to see. Because what we do today is going to determine the outcomes for tomorrow. So I just want to show a little bit of data uh, as to how we are looking at things. This is looking at overcrowded households. And again, just to don't look so much at the black dots, just the colors. Over here in the Bronx, most of the Bronx has overcrowded housing. Huh, well, how's that Manhattan looking? Not too overcrowded. Interesting, because they have different outcomes in terms of COVID, and we know that household transmission is still the uh, most common forms of tran transmission of COVID. Let's look at multi-generational households. Um, whoa, look at the Bronx versus Manhattan. So there's nothing wrong with multi-generational households. In fact, I feel bad for these people who don't live and don't have neighbors who have multi-generational households. And, and, and some of it, some of it obviously is, um, um, poverty or economic and, fisc and fiscal challenge. But I want people to also understand that a lot of it is also cultural. I'm Puerto Rican. Puerto Ricans, historically, for over 100 years, we are matriarchal uh, 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 culture, meaning that like in my, my mother-in-law's house, my grandmother, my wife's grandmother is 84 years old, you know, and she's in the household. She's, she's deteriorating a, a bit. My mother-in-law is there. And then we're always um, fighting with my wife's nieces and nephews about coming out, in and out of the house and not taking care of themselves because my Mila's there. But go to your point, uh, and you know, maybe young people may be asymptomatic and may not be getting sick, but then they could bring it home to their abuelitos and abuelitas. And that's the case in other cultures as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and it's really that it's the overlap of overcrowdedness with multi-generational. If 
your grandmother, your kid's grandmother had a separate room with a separate bathroom and a whole, you know, a lot of space in there. That's a whole different arrangement than, you know, the cousins that are coming in because something happened to them. You got to share the household with them and they're sleeping in the living room. And you guys were doing okay, let's say, with one bathroom before. But in COVID time, it, it exacerbates, as you were saying, and shines a spotlight on certain elements. So there's nothing, there's nothing, there's something you could argue, I would argue there's something great about multi-generational households. Not when it's mixed with an overcrowded household where you can't separate yourselves easily. And that is where the poverty comes in, because I don't think that's something that people want. They want their grandparents in with them, but they probably the teenagers want their own bathroom as well. <laughs> Right. So so it's it's all these things piling up on on each other. Um, and then we have a lot of essential workers in our neighborhoods, again, just drawing attention to the Bronx versus Manhattan, except for upper Manhattan here. Manhattan, what? They don't have any essential workers in their borough, apparently. Well, well, let me get, let me speak to that point. I'm sorry, because I know we have other folks, but it, this really gets me angry because now all of a sudden, um, unlike what people thought, we have a lot of people in the Bronx who, who work. Prior to the pandemic, we were down uh, to 4.6% unemployment. Yeah, That was an all-time low. When I first got to Borough Hall, we were at 14%. Now we have 21% unemployment. But the point is this. A lot of what's now called the essential worker, they were, in my opinion, not that they were, they were being treated as expendable workers. Prior to that, they never got the credit. They never got the recommendation. They never received the salaries. All of a sudden, the pandemic hits, and now they're, they're the ones being told, oh, you're an essential worker. You get on the train. You go to work while their supervisors, while their managers and, and, and folks are the ones who stay home and work remotely. And so, yes, we have margin, uh, we have um, pre-existing conditions. We have a, a, an aging population here. There's some poverty there. We could do better by the overall health care system in our borough. But it was also the fact that many of the men and women who were told that now you're an essential worker were not given the, the protection, the PPEs, to go out there and be able to protect themselves from this invisible, smellless monster and, and enemy, right? And that pisses me off. Okay. Yeah. So let's think about the policies and practices of yesterday that created this situation today and what we can do in the future. That's what I want the audience to kind of be thinking about how did we get here and how can we make it different going forward? Uh, and then finally, um, as soon as myself as a primary care doc heard that COVID, this isn't true for every virus, but COVID particularly hits people with quote unquote underlying chronic uh, illnesses uh, differently and harder. Uh, those are not evenly dispersed across the city or the borough. And that is not, again, not because of genetics. Uh, it is absolutely because of the social arrangements that we have. So this is another map where you want to look at the Bronx just, you know, for a rhetorical point and a data point versus Manhattan. So when all of those things pile up, this is COVID data. This is looking at number of cases, people who have tested positive, and look at the Bronx borough testing positive versus deaths, a little bit more evenly um, distributed, but still the Bronx having the overall highest rate of COVID-19 deaths. So all these things I mentioned before, piling on uh, and making COVID just a case study of how inequity that we live with today creates these problems that this spotlight uh, is on. So to change the health, neighborhood health of tomorrow, we need to change the policies and practices today. Um, it's not a big leap for a health department to say, the answer to the health issues that we're talking about is for people to get out and exercise their way of being engaged in, in the life around them, vote, if you were already a voter, people who were on this in this conference, that's not good enough. Find two or three or five or 10 people in your neighborhood or among your community who aren't voters and help them register to vote, get them educated about the issues. Think about how you're actually gonna do it because now we have a lot of options. Um, 
Obviously, people need to be counted in the census. Every single person who responds to the census is bringing federal dollars into our borough. I'm not going to say nothing is more important, but that's a pretty big important one. And then what's not on this slide is all of the other ways people can be engaged in their neighborhood. We've all been kind of um, more in our neighborhoods than ever before. So is there a way you could be involved in your local park and do something good for the park? Is there a way that you could get involved once we're doing more with a youth group in your area? Is there a social protest movement that you want to very, 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 very safely engage in? Those are all uh, civic engagement and they're all- Like our, like our meaningful Mondays that we've been doing and promoting where we want volunteers to come out and clean up our public parks. Being ah, perfect. Overutilized, because people have very few places to go. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So that that's a perfect one and easy to do. And you can, if you can give a lot of time, great. If you can give a little bit of time, great. It's all it's all good. We appreciate you, uh, Dr. Bedell. Let me get into, I, I don't see, her. there she goes, Dr. Branch. Um, we appreciate you coming here. And for me, you are, Obviously, taken away from nothing from everybody else, all the other panelists um, that I admire and respect. I probably know you the least, but I want you in, in the world of hip hop. We have this thing called bring the smoke. You got to bring it like bring the smoke. And I say that, Dr. Branch, because you are the um, an associate professor for racial policy um, scholar at the Metropolitan College, uh, CUNY in the city of New York. And you've been working on defining systemic racism and how it makes people sick, description of implicit bias, um, residential segregation, negative stereotypes that are created, uh, sustained inequality in communities of color, public housing, food justice, job opportunities. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You know, we, you, you, you have been an advocate, you've been an activist, uh, you've been concentrating in this area, uh, in, well, in, in, in terms of systemic racism, uh, which it, we see it common in, in, in all of society. But now when it comes to health and the lack of services or resources in our communities, Dr. Branch, I appreciate you being here and I want you to bring the smoke. So um, be, be, before that, I just want you to answer, I just have a little question for you. Um, based on your work as a race and policy scholar, uh, the question is black and, and Hispanic Bronx sites have firsthand experience with racism. They know what we know what it feels like, but they are invisible ways in which people are harmed by systemic racism. So it's not it's not overt, right? It's not in your face. Um, but uh, in terms of social, economic, and policy decisions that are being made at different government levels, how do you define and measure systemic racism in our society, Doctor? So, President Diaz, thank you so very much for. A warm welcome and thanks to your office for organizing this discussion. Thanks to Deputy Borough President Scott McFadden for inviting me to be part of this panel. Appreciation to Health Commissioner Dr. Barbeau for providing such an informative background on COVID-19 in the Bronx. And thanks also to Dr. Keck for overseeing the format of this program and a huge thanks to my co-panelists Dr. Bedell and Dr. Nunez. And so to address your question, um, how do we identify and measure systemic racism, racism in our society? Well, first let's define what systemic racism is before we can identify and measure something. We have to know what it is so we can ascertain its unit of measure. Good point, good point. And so systemic racism, <clears throat> which is also known as structural racism or institutional racism, is a system or a framework that employs processes or ways of apportioning outcomes based on ascribed values or criterion associated with one's race or phenotype that privilege some and marginalize others. And so, there are many systems through which systemic racism functions, right? And, and Dr. Bedell did a fabulous job of talking about some of those and the, the socioeconomic determinants of health. Uh, but the two that I wanna highlight 
in, in the context of COVID-19 and the black and brown communities in my allotted time are the economy and healthcare. And so it's important to frame the discussion in the disparate inequities of these systems. And so Cranes New York just had a report on the 23rd of July that they published that the Bronx is experiencing great depression levels of unemployment relative to other areas of New York City. And their report put unemployment in the Bronx at almost 25%. I think, uh, President Diaz, you said it was 21 20, well, that, that was uh, last month's, um, but we haven't, we'll get the, the um, up-to-date, you probably have an up-to-date number. And right, that's so. and that's 25% where we were at less than 5% in February. Right. And so this is 25% for the Bronx relative to 20% citywide. And, and articles also report that the Bronx had the highest number of COVID deaths per 100,000 people, and Dr. Barbeau spoke to that. And so there's also the issue of who is now deemed an essential worker and at risk on the front lines. And that is, according to Dr. Bedell's presentation, 170,000 people. And so COVID-19 disproportionately and negatively impacts Black and Latinx people and communities in the Bronx. And just to throw another stat out there, according to the Economic Policy Institute, and they measure things on a national uh, basis, the mortality rates of COVID is three times higher for Blacks versus whites. And so what are some of the measures? Well, at the beginning, when you opened up, President Diaz, you referenced the, the not 62, the hashtag not 62. That the Bronx is 62nd out of 62 counties in how well it is not, that is a glaring outcome. And so Black and Latinx communities are shouldering the long and the short-term economic shocks of COVID-19 unfortunately, and they are experiencing those shocks in the long term through job loss. Well, in the short term through job loss, but in the long term, they're experiencing those shocks through the congressional legislative impasse on a federal fiscal response in the long term. So our representatives and leaders in the nation's capital can't make a moral decision that people need some money to live. And it's not because they don't want to work, right? And so to your point, President Diaz, the Bronx at one point had a 4% unemployment rate. So it's either we are lazy and don't want to work or we're working, but the jobs that we had have been negatively impacted the result of COVID and they have gone away. Or we're in these essential frontline positions where we are putting ourselves at risk and unfortunately in some instances succumbing to this disease. So it can't be both ways when the narrative is being spun. All right, so catastrophes such as COVID-19 have negative effects. I mean, after all, it's a catastrophe. It's going to have negative effects. But the disparate impact of COVID-19 correlated with race, socioeconomic status, is indicative of the measure of systemic racism embedded in policy choices. Right, And so policy choices are connected to sociopolitical dealings based on an economy that diminishes black and brown transactions. And so note my discourse. I'm implicating the political economy as the structurally racist system. It is not that black and Latinx individuals are less than, 
it's that racist structures diminish their value. And so, as it relates to policy, policies of yesterday are, as Dr. Bedell said, having an impact on the deliverables of today. Policy I advance is the close cousin of law. Substantive law, for those of you who are attorneys in the audience, you know, govern how society is expected to behave. And the policy corollaries of the economy, healthcare, and other systems summed up or, or summed up in the performance or behavioral requirements. And these systems, these inequitable systems, make it impossible to perform these requirements. And so what has COVID done? COVID-19 has made policy violence leveled against black and brown communities visible in the same way that smartphone cameras and police body cameras and social media have made the disproportionate police violence against black and brown communities visible, right? So we have known about this. Those, who are, those of us who are in the, the policy space in the community space, we have known about these inequities. I'm gonna bring a little smoke here, doctor. Let me tell you, this is the reason why I'm so relieved that we have a Dr. Barbo in charge now. I'm gonna just say how it is. Um, by the way, we have hundreds of people who are watching either on YouTube and on Facebook Live. So greetings and welcome to you all. Thank you for participating here. We have a, a great, great set of panelists, all dynamic women, powerful women. Uh, we started with Dr. Barbo, the commissioner of, of, um, uh, of health in the city. We have Dr. Jane Bedell, who's been front and center with us in the Bronx for many, many years. She thinks that she retired, but <laughs> she hasn't. She, you know, she can keep thinking that she's with us. Um, Leslie, Leslie Branch, Dr. Branch is um, uh, a, a scholar on racism. Um, and we also have been joined in our talk. She's gonna be our next and final uh, panelists, and then we're going to go right to Q&A. We have a lot of questions. But my point is this. Several years ago, before Bar Barbo was there, we had something called Legionella in the South Bronx. And the, with the Legionella, one of the, and this is one of my fallouts four four with, with Mayor de Blasio, because the former commissioner and de Blasio, it seemed like they were blaming the victim. Oh, people, you know, forget about cleaning up, you know, whatever was causing Legionella, the sprays on top of the of the of the water um uh, uh the water towers in, in on buildings but they were saying oh it's just that that community is poor and that community is sick okay to me it was blaming the victim but if we're poor and then we're sick then maybe at that time they should have woken up when we were hooping when we were yelling and screaming to give the resources to the neighboring um health institutions give the, 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 the right information, preventive measures, and so on and so forth. And that was 16 people, I think it was 15, 16 people that died in about a five weeks period of time, right? So if you knew that then, that was the time to start getting the book. Because now everybody's saying, oh, after COVID, we need to do something. The mayor says it, everybody says it. We got to do something in, in, the, in these communities that were really, really hit hard. They should have did that in the South Bronx. And by the way, the South Bronx wasn't even the hardest hit uh, section of the Bronx with COVID. But they should have did that. And they, and they should have started with that. And they didn't. And now all of a sudden, here we are again. So yeah, this, this is the equivalent, like you said, the spotlight, the cell phone to police brutality and, and police harassment and so on and so forth that we all been protesting about. But moving forward is not enough to just say that we know the problem. Government at every level now have to give us the resources so that we can be better equipped should the sure. second wave or a third wave or maybe something else comparable to this unfortunately may come to us in the future and, and and so to your point people are emphasizing the improper thing it's not the behavior of poor communities it is the structure which is in some ways constraining the behavior of people in poor communities, but to continue on, 
What COVID-19 has clearly illuminated is what race and social policy scholars like myself, colleagues such as stratification economists like Dr. Derek Hamilton, Think You Bader, founder and community activist and Bronx native like Dr. Eddie Summers, Citizens Community for New York CEO and nonprofit and philanthropic leader like Dr. Osan Harris, folks like you and others who have been sounding the alarm about this for years. And so the nexus of ascribed values, institutions and policies that create a system that disadvantaged black and brown communities freezes them in their marginalized position through systemic racist uh, policies and practices is, is what we're seeing. And so as a policy scholar, we are at what I would suggest an Overton moment, right? So policy choices led to the socioeconomic disparities and that, that we're observing in black and brown communities. And so it's to that end that policy choices will need to be what undoes the socioeconomic disparities we are experiencing. But those policy choices have to be moral, they have to be just, and they have to be inclusive, and they have to stop blaming the victim. What right. government in some instances has done is shifted its responsibility to those who are the least among us. And then when they can't perform, it blames them. So policy change happens in three streams, problems, politics, and policies. They connect and each stream has its own force acting upon and ultimately influencing it. And so this policy stream model focuses on the importance of timing and the flow of policy actions and the timing of the present inflection point that we now find ourselves at provides us with a range of policies politically acceptable to the mainstream population right because the mainstream is now saying oh we got to do something we got to do something and so in this inflection point moment political viability of an idea is not necessarily tied to a politician's individual or personal preferences and what would usually seem too extreme a policy position given the circumstances. I mean, this is, a, this is an extreme circumstance. And so we need an extreme and a bold, we need a bold set of policy choices. And so the issues are framed. COVID-19 has illuminated socioeconomic policy violence and this is our window of discourse where we can work to shift reality to be congruent with the American discourse of all persons are created equal and liberty and justice for all. This is our Overton moment and we cannot squander it. And so Agreed. Agreed. what, what is it that we can do, right? Yes. I'm gonna definitely echo some of the things that Dr. Bedell said. Uh, for starters, we need to complete the 2020 census. I, I was at a conference a couple of days ago, and for every person that is not counted or uncounted, and this was a this was put out by the George Washington University uh, counting dollars for 2020, uh, their Institute of Public Policy. For every individual that is uncounted in the census, New York will lose $2,687 in federally funded programs. Let me, let, this is the way I like to couch it. So I'm sorry, you, is, is the census, I know you're going to say vote, probably, right? You got to vote. You got to be able to, you know, articulate the case to your local elected leaders, to uh, people at the city, at the state level. The borough president can't do it alone. Right. Beating me up and 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 um, sending me messages on social media is no longer enough. I need everybody's help here, right? I've been trying for my entire political career, and we need everybody to go in. But on the census, let me just say this: so far, our response rate has only been fifty-four percent. That's abysmal. That means you know that's about you know half. Um, so 
please, it only takes 10 seconds. It, 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 so many people in the Bronx filled out the absentee ballots for the primary. Uh, we were happy with that. The census form, the application takes a fraction of the time of the absentee ballot. So if you did the absentee ballot, you can certainly do the, the census, or you can go to online and go to my2020census.gov, or you can call and do it on the phone, 1-844-330-2020. 1-844-330-2020. This is the way that I like to put it, Dr. Branch. We all coordinate social gatherings or events in our families, right? Birthday right. parties, weddings, so on and so forth. The way I look at it is like this. The application is the invite. And if you, if you are someone who is organizing, Dr. Bedell, a birthday party or an anniversary party, if you send out 100 invites, if 100 people send them back, those are the people that you wanted and you will be equipped to accommodate 100 people. But if you send out 100 invites and only 25, or in this case, 50 people send it back, then what are you going to do? You're going to only prepare to feed and accommodate 50 people. Now, what happens on the day of the event if 100 people, which in this case, we, you know, we have 1.5 million people, but if only a fraction, and so right now, if only we have half, then the government is only being, is giving us resources for only half of our population. The rest of the population is not going anywhere. It's not like you're going to be able to say to the family who didn't fill out the census, your child can't come to the school. You still need a child seat. You need, you need a, a desk and a chair there. It's not like you're only going to pay or get resources for half of the streets in the Bronx. We need to fix the streets. We need transportation. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. So every one of you, if you are out there and you get upset about the lack of resources for our parks, transportation, for housing, for school, so on and so forth, send in your invitation, bring it, send it back, send in your application so that we can get fully funded so the federal government can give us the resources so that we can accommodate 100% of the Bronx population. Thank you, President Diaz. And so definitely register to vote if you're not. If there are ballot questions with regard to an election year issue, if you're not clear about what it means, get with somebody to figure out what it means so they can explain it to you. Consider running for office yourself, yeah. right? That's we, we've seen a lot of that. Yeah. We've seen a lot of that. <laughs> and then finally, there is a website, right? So it's vote411.org slash ballot. And you can type in your zip code and learn where the candidates running for office in your particular district stand on the issues. So this way you can be an informed voter. Right. And then finally, from a community health standpoint, Monroe, Metropolitan College of New York has <coughs> a one year accelerated master's degree in community health. Consider registering for it and take it because at the community level, we who live in the community are the, 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 the gatekeepers. We should be the gatekeepers. And if we want to be informed and particularly around a community health uh, perspective, a degree in community health would certainly be valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Branch. Uh, I know you're going to stick around. We want to get to questions. We have a lot of questions out there, but I want to bring in um, our final panelists here. And that's none other than somebody who's really grown on me in a short period of time. We've been doing a couple of these panel conversations um, over the last maybe th uh, two or three years. Dr. Denise Nunez is a physician at the front uh, of the SOMOS uh, Montefiore Partnership. SOMOS, and she'll explain what SOMOS is. SOMOS is a like a um, a Latinx but, um, healthcare network, but they help out everybody. Um, and, and during when COVID first hit us, Dr. Denise Nunez was one of, if not the first person to raise a hand and come to ground zero with testing locations. Uh, we did the first one. The first one was across the street from Lehman College. That was in partnership with the state, in partnership with Montefiore. Um, she's before that the SOMOS healthcare system 
um, it, and again, she'll explain, but uh, how vast it is. Uh, they, 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 they're there to protect the most marginalized communities, vulnerable patients, um, give different treatment, make sure that they do it in the native tongue and the native language. We all know that a lot is lost in translation. Even if you have the best doctors and nurses giving us services, but the, the instructional, the medical instructions aren't given in the native tongue, Russian, Spanish, uh, you know, he, whatever it is, Hebrew, uh, uh, whatever, if it's not given to the patient in their native tongue, a lot gets lost in translation and the results are gonna be less than desirable. Um, she is amazing. And right now, right now, she's in Florida. So she, with all of the, the, the craziness, I, with all the things that she experienced in New York City, we all know that Florida and other parts of the country are now, they, they're hitting their peaks. What does she do instead of saying, whoo, I did my job? She's in Florida, so she took time and took a break away from helping and saving lives in Florida to be with us. Uh, Dr. Nunez, you have a unique dual perspective from your SOMOS practice, caring for families from many Bronx neighborhoods to treating COVID-19 patients in the hospitals everywhere, even now in Florida. How have you seen health disparities affect people in our Bronx community? And who has the most vulnerable, or who was the most, has been the most vulnerable to the coronavirus? Welcome, doctora. <laughs> Bienvenida. Gracias. Bienvenida. Gracias. Se tiene de gratis. <laughs> Yeah. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. And yes, I am actually at the site, and um, that's why I'm here. So so sorry. I, I had a plan to be all you know, but this is what it is. I'm very happy I'm here. Um, I um, so I'm going to answer the question with a little presentation I did. I thought I'd just um, I, I I believe in pictures, and and I and I have like a little just presentation about pictures about that's what good. I do. In the I'm, I'm a visual person. I like that. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so I just need a second to share, and if you don't mind, let me just do this with the help of this amazing team. Go right ahead. Yep. Thank you. Yep. I'm going to go here, and my. I'm sorry if I am not doing this correctly, but I'm going to try to do this as much as I can. Again, we have a lot of viewers on um, Facebook, okay. on YouTube, um, so we thank you all for joining us. Go ahead, doctor. Oh, great. So I'm going to, well, I'm just doing it backwards, but it's fine. This so, um, can you see there? Um, uh, yes, yes, there? we can see. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, yes, yeah, so I am, uh, I thought it was just an easier way to just show people what we do at the community level. Um, I think uh, pictures are worth, you know, a million words, so I think it was just an easier way for me to present. Um, I am a uh, Dominican Latina, <laughs> born here but raised in Dominican Republic, intensivist, and also general pediatrician. Um, and let me know if you can't hear me very well, please. Um, thank you, sir. So, um, so um, I work mainly in the Bronx, and um, and for all this COVID time, I don't think a lot of people knew what the intensivists were. Because I would say, oh, I'm a critical, I'm an intensivist, and people are like, what's that? So now that COVID is around, um, so we are besides the ER physicians, we are the uh, frontliners who are really taking care of all these patients um, in the ICU. So we're intubating and, and making sure our COVID patients, um, with everything that we didn't know about COVID, keep these, keep these patients alive. Um, um, so while I was in, uh, so as you mentioned, um, the ICU is a location where, you know, we actually serve 365 days a year, 24 seven in the ICU. And that's what I've been doing for years. Um, um, and this is actually one of the things I also do is that I've gone to a lot of medical missions. So this is actually a patient from Haiti who we did some heart surgeries um, and um, uh, the surgeons did heart surgeries and we come down actually to do the post-op care to make sure they survive after their surgeries and then they can go home. So we've done this uh, throughout the, the, um, the state, but a lot of people, a lot, a lot of countries, but a lot of people, the real question that they ask me is why, um, I decided to be an intensivist and go back to the community and become a community-based provider. So I'm an intensivist, a critical care doctor at Montefiore, Children's Hospital at Montefiore, and I'm a community-based provider 
with the uh, SOMOS Community Care Network, which is a network of over a thousand physicians that work directly with the community. And we look like our community. We speak the same language of our community so we can connect with them, which is very, very important these days and always. Um, one of the things that I, I'm very grateful is that as an intensivist, um, I am a and dual community-based provider, I am able to actually take care of patients in the ICU and then go to the clinic and follow them up at the clinic. So that transition of care is very, very important because there's so many things that can you lose, um, uh, get lost in follow-up. So we take care of our patients in the clinic, and these are just two very examples that I love. This uh, little kid has uh, glasses on. He's about four years old, um, and he is actually a liver transplant patient. He wow. had his liver transplanted when he was uh, less than two months. He stayed in the okay. hospital for a long time because his belly was okay. so... His liver was out. We, we were able to get a liver from a, a larger kit, so his belly, we couldn't close it. And um, he stayed a long time. We were able to close it. And now you can see that he has his glasses and he has his book bag. So this is these all the pictures I'm showing are pre-COVID pictures. So he's able to have his book bag, and he went to show me that he was starting, pre, um, he was starting daycare. So he's very, very happy. So that's a picture I took. And the other picture is a lovely, lovely girl. You can't see her very well, but she's on the bed in the ICU. She's been in the ICU in and out since a little girl, but one thing you don't see is that she's actually modeling for us. Her hand on the side is modeling. She's putting her hand because oh, she on a on her hip. Yeah, she's putting her hand. <laughs> yes, and she is. The, she's actually deaf. She she don't hear. She only has one butt. She's deaf. She breathes through her trach and she eats through her stomach. But right now, she actually goes to school. She has a book bag too. She goes to school. And um, we're able at the, our community-based practice, we're able to follow up with all her um, physicians from the hospital. We, we created a team that actually um, we take care of all her needs and we're able to almost get her back to normal-ish life, right? So that's what I do in the ICU. Um, but why did I decide to go to the uh, community base? So one of the things I did at, Mont at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore was that um, I was seeing that a lot of my patients, a lot of the diseases that were coming in to the hospital were act and there were patients that were admitted, pediatrics were actually diseases that were conditions of those diseases that were preventable. So patients could have, we could have done something at our community-based level or at the PCP level and prevent that patient from getting admitted to the ICU. So I said, you know, this, this, and it was happening a lot and was happening to, and it is still happening in our community, in Latino community. So I, you know, got in contact with Somos Community Care with Dr. Talaj. She supported me fully, and we opened our practice that I, I that uh, not a lot of people have seen. But what I have is a, a different model of practice. I have my practice, and then in front of the practice, I have a foundation, and then I have an urgent care also. So it's all in the same community, trying to keep um, not only our our patients healthy physically, but also mentally, and also trying to take care of the social issues that our patients have. Um, so with that said, this is our foundation, and one of the things we do in our foundation is um, this is one of the programs that we have. It's called Bronx Leaders of the Future, and we bring leaders from different um, parts of the community, and we teach our, our students um, about leadership. But the most important thing of all that I do uh, um, in our community is that we actually teach them to take control of their health. Um, why? We have different generations in our community. We have our older generation, our younger generation. Our older generation in our culture, this is something very important that you said, sir, which was that um, we speak the same language, but sometimes it's not only the same language. It's to be culturally sensitive. It's to try to um, translate in lay terms. When I created the Family Center Care Rounds at Montefiore, it, it was not enough to just translate in Spanish, right? Because you can say intubation, intubar, and you have, so they don't understand what dubar means. That means to put a tube in their throat. So you also have to try to be, um, try to talk to your family, to the patients in a lay term that they understand. Because one of the things that we're very good at is not going to the doctor. So our community does not go and take and, and do their well visit. They don't go for preventive medicine. They do not screen. Um, that's our culture. We don't have that in our country. So why would you do it here? So, um, so those are the things that we're working with the youth because they're able to teach their parents and their grandparents to make sure that they go and get screening and they go for the preventive care. So that's what we do at the foundation and that's what we do at the clinic. Also, um, at the younger kids, we actually teach them how to eat healthy. 
Um, and you can see we have snacks here. And it's easier at the younger level because at the older level, it's kind of a little bit harder. But the issues that I find here is that you can see some of the kids are obese. So one of the medical conditions that affected, especially on, 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 on this time, was patients with obesity, patients with, with um, diabetes, right? Those are the kids that really, and patients that we saw in the ICU admitted because of COVID. Um, so going back to the ICU, um, it wasn't an easy, um, uh, easy times. So it's, you know, we're actually a little bit better now that I'm able to come here and help here. Um, but when uh, it hit us literally like from one day to the other, um, where we had to go from receiving, you know, two or three patients a day to actually going and receiving 30 patients a day and changing the entire hospital at Montefiore, the children's hospital into the adult. So hospital. So that took all of us, all, our, all of our efforts, plus getting help from the other floors, getting help from the residents, and putting the, IC, the hospital in an entire ICU. At the community base, so that's at the ICU level. You know, I, I can't just uh, say enough about it and, and, and just remind everybody that we were the ones of, you know, of uh, the minority were the ones that were affected the most, right? We had the, the, the highest, uh, one of the highest rate of infection and also the highest mortality. So, and I'm pretty sure all the panelists talk about that, but that is, that's very impressive. And we have to think about that, why did that happen? Um, but at the community level, things that I saw and, and I know you were at one of our events too, and I call them events, it's really, uh, it, yeah, we have to say events, but it's really uh, programs that we have, was that one of the things that I saw in our community was that we give food at midday, right? And our lines went from 50 to next day 100, to next day 200, 300. They were blocks long. And two things happened there. I had to start coming out of the, out of the, 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 um, the, the foundation and start walking and talking to our parents and asking them, because I saw a lot of my parents there, um, asking them, you know, what's going on. And, um, you know, most of the parents lost their jobs. So they were homeless. Their kids were homeless. So most of the people were in shelters. Um, and, uh, um, which, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it, it, it was, it gives me a little bit of, you know, because you have to live it and see it. Um, when you see that they would be there at, eight in the morning when the food was supposed to be at 12 o'clock or seven in the morning when the food was to be there given at 12 or one o'clock. So these were one of the issues that we found in our community and I'm pretty sure everybody spoke about that, but this is a picture of everybody making a line just for food. Um, as you mentioned, um, we were thinking out of the box and thinking out of the hospital, what could we do with our community? And I know you're at one of the sites that we uh, actually opened. Um, mm -hmm. That site was a drive-through site. And one of the things that I realized that is that most of our patients in our community did not have a card to go and get tested. And also were very, very afraid of getting tested. They were very afraid of if they, you know, we have a lot of patients that are undocumented patients. So um, parents. Um, so what, um, uh, thanks to um, Dr. Talaj and Somos, we were able to, in our practices to create um, centers there were walk-through centers. And here, we were able to ask our families to come in and get tested. So we were able to find out who was positive and make sure these patients were not go out and keep on spreading, you know, spreading the, the entire community. Um, one of the other things that was, I think was just incredible was also going to the churches. Churches, remember, we're all very faithful people, all Latinos uh, and all of us in general, very faithful. So we were looking for places that people would go and, and um, assist. So we were able to also create, this is one of the basements of, um, this is St. Nicholas of Talentine um, basement that um, uh, we were able to create also um, tents and um, test our patients. Um, so why, and, and this is just me in the ICU, so why did I decide to um, go from becoming an intensivist and saving lives? This actually is a pretty interesting picture and this can tell you how, um, how what we were doing in the ICU, as you can see, this is one of my nurses is in on the behind me and just pointing out to these pumps. Um, these patients were inside uh, of the room and we were exposed every second to patients with COVID. And we're only a few. We're not a lot of intensivists in the ICU. I mean, you can come and help, but not everybody has the skills that intensivists has for intubating or CPR or anything like that. So we had to protect ourselves. And one of the, so we didn't, so one of the things to try to decrease the amount of time we were inside of the rooms and exposed to COVID was to actually bring all these pumps out. These, all these pumps had medications that kept the patients alive. So if you can see the pumps are outside and then you can see the tubes on the side that were going inside the patient. So we would manage all these tubes 
from outside, all the medications from outside. So here we were saving lives, but us together as, and this is a message I want to give, is not only SOMOS, but I think all of us, including Montefiore System and SOMOS, all together as providers, we are the ones saving lives. We need to get together and we need to talk to our families. We need to educate our families. And, and, and I'm pretty sure some people have seen what are the methods I've used for um, educating our families about healthcare, about you know all the risks is social media. And I know you spoke about social media, but I did a little survey. And one of the things I did is I tried to figure out how I was able to connect to these patients because using emails, I was not able to connect with everybody. Um, texting them, I was not able. Um, most of the times they wouldn't give you the right number, but they would connect through Facebook and they would ask me questions through Facebook. So now we use Facebook for our parents and we use um, and it's something as, as simple as Instagram for our youth. Twitter, yeah. they can use Twitter, at least around my area. So one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to do with all, and that's what SOMAS is doing, is all of us as physicians, these are all pediatricians, getting together and making sure we educate our families, making sure our families come from us. Yeah. Our pa patients have to come and get their well visits. They have to come to the hospital. They have to come to their PCP. They need to come and get their, their um, physicals. They need to be checked. Our kids need their vaccines. There's, I, our parents um, got, um, I think, scared because of everything that's happening and we were all telling them not to go to the ER, which I completely understand, but they need to go and see their doctors. Um, we're not seeing them coming to the doctors. They need to connect with the doctors um, to make sure they get the care they need and to make sure they're prepared for what's coming. So um, this is uh, me, um, uh, an intensivist that became a community-based um, provider, still an intensivist, but working directly with the community. We appreciate We appreciate you. We applaud you. You are one of the many thousands of heroes that we clap for at 7 p.m. for the last several months. Uh, I want to thank all of you, the panelists that are, are with us. I think, do we still have um, Dr. Bedell with us as well? I hope we didn't lose her. Um, I'm yeah, gonna, I'm here. I'm here. I'm going to uh, turn over this next portion of the program um, to... Dr. Nancy Kett, who is the director of health in my office. This is sort of like the Q&A session. There are lots and lots of people who are on watching us live. We thank you. I know that some folks will then watch us when it replays or they can replay it later. Um, to all the panelists, you're doing God's work. Thank you for being with us here today, but more importantly, thank you for what you've been doing for many, many years. Um, I hope, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Stay safe. Uh, and with nothing else left to be said, Dr. Nancy Kett from my office, take it away. <laughs> Leave your table for hands. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. So we have some questions from the public. Uh, I wanted to start with one for Dr. Bedell. This comes from uh, Ms. Dozier from the Bronx Children's Museum. And she asks, uh, what is being recommended regarding precautions for entities who offer in-person programming at events? When can we start, you know, doing, um, when can we begin to do this and what measures need to be taken? So you, that, that's a public health question. Where do we have to be in order to allow for public events safely? Great question. Appreciate the question. Uh, so, you know, that New York City, we are, uh, slowly um, easing up on the restrictions, but we're following the data very, 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 very carefully. So there, there are many sets of recommendations and protocols on the New York City Department of Health website. So if people are interested in seeing what kinds of guidance the health department has already offered to primary care clinics, to work sites, et cetera, et cetera, um, and if you have problems navigating the site, um, you know, get in touch with me or my staff and, and we can we can help you with that. Uh, the time to more fully open is really determined by the pace of the infection. We have been in a low level community wide transmission place now for many weeks and we're going to slowly move things uh, so that we ease up. And the most economically important things get priority. That's the way that the state has set this up. 
uh, which, which, you know, you have to see overall makes sense. So I can't answer the question specifically because that's one of those questions I don't know and you don't know and the borough president doesn't know because nobody knows yet. We're watching the data and slowly we will ease up on the restrictions. And if you want to get a flavor for what um, having a safe indoor space is going to feel like, go to some of those protocols for other things. Um, and my colleague, I think Anna Schatz, is going to put some links up in the chat so that people can just see the link and click on them. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question is for Dr. Branch, and that comes from Stephen DeCastro. And his question reads, one factor which may amplify the COVID crisis is the looming eviction crisis. So what is the scale of the potential eviction crisis in the Bronx, and what steps should be taken now that it appears that the moratoriums may expire? I would add to that, as allies, what can we do in order to advance policies that are not favoring black and brown people? And that is that is really- Before answer that, doctor, let me just take some executive privileges. I say we should cancel the rent. Cancel the rent. The federal government should be bailing out renters in the same spirit that they do to corporate America, to the financial institute, institutions, to the airline. Bail out the people and cancel the rent. But go ahead. That's it. There you go. Dr. Branch, please. Every time we have seen some sort of a crisis over the last couple of crises, corporate America is always bailed out. Main Street is left with a bag of crumbs, if that. And so my view is from a policy perspective, we need to go big and bold. There should be a federal jobs guarantee, right? And that's a, a program at the federal level where if people want a job and they are able to work, that they should have a job. The social safety net in this country definitely needs to be shorn up. And there's a great book that I would love to recommend. It's by Ira Katz Nelson, When Affirmative Action Was White. And so affirmative action at one point in time was white. All of these social programs that happened were given no questions asked to white people. Even before the social safety network, there were land grants that were given uh, to white folks and black and brown people were intentionally left out. Based on the type of job you had, you could have benefits or you could not. The fact that health insurance in this country is tied to whether or not you have a job, one, and then the kind of job you have, two, is very problematic. And it is an indication of this country's failure to provide and to protect against these, these market failures in a way that, that really threaten our national security, right? Think about it. You turn all of these folks out into the street because they can't pay rent. And then what happens? People spread the disease and, and it's just, it's, it's nuts, right, to, to put it mildly. It is nuts. And so the government needs to rethink things, right? And so, again, when I spoke about this notion of the economy and how it apportions uh, goods and services, perhaps we need to think about how our economy is organized because capitalism, right, it's for the rest of us. Right, when you think about it, when government at the federal level does things, right, and if you've ever watched how policy is made, it's like making sausage. It's not pretty. Those guys and ladies get into a room and they go to bat for one another. And then when you need a favor, they expect you in turn to help them. So they tell us this narrative about pull yourself up by your bootstraps and bootstrap it and all like that. But that's not what happens in reality. And so what's good for the goose is good for the gander. 
And I really think that given where we are in terms of COVID, people just need to understand that this is not normal. And so we can't do policy the normal way that we did it. You can't get blood from a stone. So BP, this is a question for you from uh, Kim Famous. It says, is there any consideration for the Bronx to be counted as a separate county in the governor's reopening plans? Mm. Being that our stats and our COVID rates are higher. Right. And of course, because we're still at number 62 in terms of health outcomes. And reopening of schools is particularly dangerous because of transgenerational households. So when they say treat us as a different county, does that mean uh, not opening up our schools at, in the same time frame as other counties? I, 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 don't, I, I don't have a, a full grasp of the question. So I think that um, from everything that I know in politics and everything that I know from being in Albany and everything that I know uh, with my relationship with the governor and my conversations with the mayor, there's, no, there's little chance of any that the Bronx will be counted separately as it relates to reopening um, schools or restaurants. I think they're going to treat the entire city of New York um, the same. Uh, I do hope that when we move forward, as we move forward, that we're, that we're looked upon, um, I want to say favorably, but equitably, when it comes to the resources that we need in terms of job opportunities and the kind of jobs and what Dr. Branches is talking about, in terms of resources for our, our school system and our kids, uh, in terms of making sure that uh, the, the, the marginalized communities, our elderly population, our nursing homes are, are, are fully equipped so that should something like this happen again, uh, we can be, again, better prepared. But even if it doesn't happen again, we're sick and tired of being considered in last place. Um, you know, we're sick and tired of being looked over. We've done a whole lot better with the relationships and the, the you know the things that we've been able to do at least since I've been the borough president, having Speaker Carr Hasty um, in the New York State Assembly. Uh, but I don't think that we just to answer the question. I don't think that we'll be treated any differently in terms of reopenings. What we need to do is have them not necessarily treat us differently from other boroughs, but treat us differently in terms of overall resources. Correct. The way that they've been treating us in the past. So can I can I add to that? Just, I want to take a little example, which, which I think the borough president knows, knows um, some of the history of this. So long ago, we had very overcrowded schools. And so one of the responses was to build these trailers that sat in the uh, yards, yeah. right? But you get no PE. You don't get any PE with the kids. And that took away the PE. And some of those trailers, there's a school on my way to my old work site where the trailer kind of got... Uh, refurbished so it's kind of a permanent building now in that and there's still no yard for those children and they have a very small classroom okay COVID comes along and what we need for COVID is a lot of space if you have a gym in your building that's good if you have an operational schoolyard that's good if you have little trailers which is what you've got on the last set of physical problems with the buildings you're not going to do so well. So this, yes, the schools are going to work really hard to try to figure out what can fit. And it's going to depend quite a bit on what the physical characteristics of the school building are. So the policies and practices of the past in terms of the way the buildings look, does the, the new building that got built, does it have a really nice big gym or does it have one of those multi-purpose rooms that the health department, we don't care for too much. And you see how this rolls forward. Now the schools that are giant and big and were built with that money are going to do better with reopening. So the question begs a look to, to Dr. Branch's points, um, I think, uh, and experientially to what Dr. Nunez has been talking about of what people have now and how that's going to propel us forward. I'll, I'll say this, I'll say this, in some of the more affluent communities in New York City, forget about New York State, in New York City, and even in the Bronx, right? Once, uh, you know, the, not not all Bronx schools are equal here, right? right. <laughs> let's, get, let's get this straight, number one. And so some of them, a lot of those schools in, in, in certain communities, they weren't overcrowded to begin with. 
to, to uh, Dr. Bedell's point, that where you need space and you need room, so maybe some of these schools would be better equipped. But when I say we need to be treated equitably, in some of the schools, should we do, for example, what um, uh, public advocate Jamani Williams uh, proposed, which is to bring in, you know, slowly but surely different age groups in the different schools. I saw an op-ed this morning in one of the papers where the controller said we should use the millions and millions of square feet of yard space, outside space, and convert that into learning spaces. And in, in, in many of the schools in the Bronx and, and in other parts of the city where we were hit hard with the COVID, resources are this. What about just counselors? Many of our kids are traumatized. They're traumatized because they're not living a normal school experience. They didn't do that in the last school year. They haven't seen their friends. They, they, um, they, they're not able to go on class trips. They're not able to, to go out and do recreational things. All the things that we enjoyed as children when we went to school. And not only that, if we saw higher fatality rates in many of our communities, then guess what? Those are kids in the schools now that over the last four or five or six months, by the time the school year starts, they lost abuelito, abuelita, a parent, mom or dad. Or, are we giving them the counseling? Are we going to now send in the resources? Because those kids are traumatized. You can't expect a kid to, to learn and grasp, no matter how well the teacher is, no matter what equipment you give them or great books or even learning space, if they are depressed, if they're traumatized, and no one has helped them de deal with that loss. We need that resource. Thrive NYC, we hear that they've had, oh, you know, the first thing over a billion dollars. Put some of that money in the counseling to the kids in some of our communities who have lost loved ones. But go ahead, next one. Thank you. That dovetails quite well with uh, the question for Dr. Nunez. And this comes from a New York City teacher at Bronx Park Middle School, Jennifer Fall. And she says, Dr. Nunez, I'd, I, if I have to return to school in September, what are your precautions and recommendations for teachers? She is worried about herself as a teacher and also for families when sending children back into the classroom. What do we need to know and do? And that's crucial because I think we are highly focused on children. There are adults, teachers, who will also have to risk their lives. They then become essential workers and first responders. What, what, what advice do you have, Dr. Nunez? Uh, so I think, um, first of all, I would say we have to prepare for the worst. It's one of the things that we need to do as parents and as teachers, because we really don't know where this is going. And I know the Department of Health, with the Department of Education is working um, heavily in trying to get the schools reopened. Um, they're giving options to the parents to do either, you know, stay home or, or you know, go to school and do the hybrid. Um, what I'm doing with my parents, and I can I can share this with my parents, and I do want all these all, all the families and whoever's listening to try to do this. They have to um, join hands with their pediatricians. Um, why? We need to make sure, as I mentioned before, that all these kids are are first tested and um, make sure we test their immunoglobulins, but also make sure they have the well visits and their vaccines. A lot of our kids during this uh, period did not go to the doctors who don't have their vaccines, so they're not vaccinated. They're, they can be exposed. So they need to get their vaccines and get their well visits. In the meantime, besides that, this is a precious time for the parents to actually prepare um, for um, getting ready um, if they need to get any equipment. or so what are they going to do with their schedules? Um, their life is going to change. Remember, it's not only the mental health of the children, it's also the mental health of the parents. So um, we have to also really look at our parents and see what they're going to do and help them. We have to partner with the pediatrician, as I said, and a very, very important point was the social, uh, the mental health. Um, I, I was actually writing something up about mental health and how now this is so important with our kids in school. I, I have several parents, kids that lost their parents, both parents. Um, I have that just lost one. So on top of that, now this whole, you know, it hasn't stopped. So what are we going to do with these kids? We need to make sure they come to the pediatrician so we do get mental health. We do get a psychologist to help them out, to help them cope. Um, at the same time, the school must have also mental health support for these kids. Um, so I think this is a precious time for the parents to get ready. Um, the, uh, get ready in that sense um, on you know what they need, what they need for home, because I, I, I don't foresee the schools opening, to be completely honest. Um, uh, 
we don't know what's happening. The, the second wave. Well, none, none of us know. None of us know. We, you know, we don't know. We us, wait, we're yeah. all waiting on the governor. Exactly. We don't. don't there, there could either be full openings. Yes, sir. Or there could be partial openings. There could be a hybrid of some so kids staying at, at home and some kids going to school. Dr. Nunez, let me just, uh, just to piggyback a little bit on that, because I know that Rogia, I think is the way you pronounce it, also asked this question. How important oh. is healthy eating? We talk about physical exercise and how is it, you know, um, um, plant-based foods, should this, you know, when we talk about resources, should the city now focus on a lot of that? On that? I, I, I think they should, but from, a, from your perspective. And then last, and then, on that, do you think that there should be um, ongoing, should the schools open? We don't know yet, but should they open whether for teachers, faculties, and the students, ongoing testing for COVID? Okay. Not, not, just, not just temperature, but testing for COVID inside the school building. So I, I, I believe that we should test the patient, the students before going into school, definitely. We should see their status and see what they're doing. And um, I think we should do the screening. Um, definitely of the temperature when they come in. Um, I don't know how feasible it is that we're going to do an ongoing testing inside the schools. You need to have a location um, for a, what we call red zone to stay to. So we have to look at the infrastructure of the school and you have to make sure you have a red zone where you can do the testing. Um, nobody can go in those rooms. So those are the things that we need to sort of like sort out. And how about, how about eating healthy? How about eating healthy? Is that, oh, eating healthy is, is definitely very important. important. That is very, very important because the healthier you eat, the better your immune system is, the better the you know, your levels are of any you know, of vitamins. So remember, our kids actually eat a lot of junk food, right? There's no nutrients in the junk foods. Um, because they're low economic status, people, it's easier to just go to McDonald's. And I'm sorry, I'm not saying anything about that, but to just get a dollar sandwich there and just eat it, right? A burger. Um, so plant-based food definitely um, increases, uh, the patients are much healthier and increases the immune system. So definitely, I would, I would definitely suggest uh, uh, eating healthy. Definitely. Nancy, go ahead. Next question. Thank you. Uh, oh, actually, we are at the end. One more thing, Nancy, if I might. So the, the key to opening up anything is getting low levels of transmission everywhere. Everybody on this panel is going to. So I know that people can go into a deep space about all of the particularities, and those have to be nailed down for sure. Nobody wants to put teachers or staff or children or parents at risk. Nobody wants to do that. And it won't work because if we do things uh, incorrectly, it will inflame the virus. So the key, underlying key to everything is what New Yorkers already know. Just to say, we have crushed this curve and we've crushed it in the Bronx. The rates are so low. People said it could not be done and we're keeping it low so far. So I just want to reiterate what the commissioner said. Don't leave home if you're sick. Stay at home and in your close circle as much as possible. Be super careful when you're out and wear a face covering. And don't forget about the magic of hand washing 20 seconds of soap and water. That is the ticket to anything going forward. So I just, I have to say that. Dr. Bedell, on that note, on that note I'm going to sound, I don't want to get in trouble here. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. But I'm almost fearful to talk about the decreasing numbers because the more we talk about it, the more people say, oh, look, everything is great. And then they have, they're hanging out. Do you see what's happening in the streets? They're having like car parties. They have bars out of the trunks. They are in the parks. And, and, and the, so the more that the governor goes on TV, the more that we say, look, it's working, it's working, it's working. That's good news. But it's almost like the more good news we give to the public, the more they feel like they can just go out there and break all, the, all of these social uh, distancing ordinances, right? My, my question is, don't these folks, listen, in my neighborhood, my next door neighbors both had it, one very sick. My daughter's, uh, her best friend from elementary school, dad, had it and died. We're, we're, I feel like New Yorkers, aren't we all a little traumatized? I mean, in my neighborhood alone. Um, so I'm face covering every day. In the Bronx, you can't, look, in the Bronx, we lost over 5,000 lives. Yeah. And that's that's directly from COVID. There's still questionables, you know what, you know how the statistics go. They could be co co uh, COVID correlated or whatever. That is more, in my opinion, and maybe we should have some institution do the, and give us the empirical data. I believe 
that over the last four months, we certainly have had more deaths from COVID than the entire state of Connecticut, than the entire state of New Jersey, just in the Bronx, than the entire state of Texas, just in the Bronx. But I also believe that if you take all causes of death, all, not some, not most, all causes of death in the history of our borough and add them on, I don't believe that there's been a four month period of time where you had this much death in our borough. So, to your so how are we going to keep the message yeah, strong? I agree. Like the, I'll put it up to the point, panel. Like we should be traumatized and we shouldn't be out there partying. We had a lot of fatality. We had a lot of loss. And if nothing else, we should be in mourning right now. But people are out there shaking their asses and it pisses me off. I, I hate to talk like this, but go ahead. No, I'm not okay. running anymore for any re-election or anything. So I guess I get a little bit of a leeway. Nancy, the next question. Dr. All right. We have one last question we're going to take from the chat. This came from uh, Bob Kaplan. Uh, is there data about per capita health spending in each community when you show those maps? In other words, in the more impoverished areas, is the same amount of spending on health care, preventative and interventional, being done as in the more affluent communities in Manhattan and other boroughs. Thank you, Bob Kaplan. I'm gonna answer that a little bit and maybe throw it, throw it to the other people. I think it's important as I was trying to suggest, what is the spending on things that make a community healthy? Right. Yes, right. the medical spending is important, but you know whether we physicians uh, feel relief from this or terrible about it, only 20% of the life and death of people, morbidity and mortality, has to do with medical care. Only 20%. 80% has to do with whether you can find your plant-based foods easily, how much they cost, whether you have a job, whether you've gotten a high school education, whether you have access to a gym, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to look at the overall investments and in what makes a community healthy. And the answer is quite clear on that, that some neighborhoods get a lot of investment and other neighborhoods don't. And I want to throw it quickly. I know we're out of time, basically, but Dr. Nunez and Dr. Branch, I'm sure you can file on on that. It's very hard to, to like, as I said, plant, I mean, just eating healthy. You can't. How can you ask a parent to feed two children or three with their salary? Um, it's just impossible right now in the community. So and, and to... To, to add to my uh, co-panelists, that everything is so tied to whether one is employed or not, and then the level of employment or the type of employment you have is then tied to the wage or the salary that you make. I think you can sort of anecdotally back into it what the answer to that is. Excellent, thank you. I wanted to say before we go to our final round where you each get one minute to answer one question, um, I got an email from a colleague at Montefiore, uh, who, uh, Dr. Rosie Chabra, who heads the mental health services at Montefiore's school-based health clinics. And that goes directly to what Dr. Nunez spoke about because there's a unique relationship. They are members of the hashtag not 62 campaign for a healthier Bronx. And there are in the school buildings. There are school-based health clinics. Right, and we and we've um, allocated. Um, we funded them. Yes. Uh, allocated a lot of uh, capital funding into some of those. Um, so yeah. Some of those clinics are reopening now. We we used to have over sixty. I'm not sure how many are reopening, but it's unique partnership with DOE. They vaccinate. They do reproductive health. You know, they they. You, uh, high school students can get contraception and, and safe information. And we can also consider those as optional places for testing. I think, uh, you know, that is a good partnership and something to talk about in future. So final round. The question Dr. is, yeah. yes, yeah. <laughs> through the lens of your work, what are some of the concrete actions that we, the public, can do in order to reduce health disparities? You've mentioned them already. Uh, I'm gonna start with Dr. Branch on that. Concrete actions. There is, as my colleague, Dr. Nunez said, education about the, the little things. And, and I don't, when I say little, I don't mean to minimize them, but one's diet is so integral to how, whether 
one can weather a, a storm, right? And so eating yogurt, right? So as simple and, and insignificant as that sounds, if we put good probiotics in our gut, we can build our immune system to fight off a lot of stuff. Uh, number one, just from a policy perspective, for those who are allies to black and brown communities, you have the power more so than the black and brown allies to lobby your elected officials. I mean, raise these issues with them. Another thing that can be done from an educational standpoint, and, and I know people may not like studying economics, but the reason we study economics is so we can be better informed citizens about what society does with the resources that it has. Because that's essentially what the study of economics is. And then also civic engagement and studying politics. Politics is the power to decide who gets what, when, and how. And if you don't understand how these systems work, they're just going to run rough shot over you and take advantage of you, unfortunately. Thank you. Dr. Nunez? Um, I think the most important is to make sure that you take care of your, um, your health, manage your health, um, partner with your provider. Um, make sure you go and, um, and do your well visits. Um, for the kids, make sure they go and do their well visits. Um, I know we talked about telehealth. I think in the side of the of the physicians, we have to understand our community, and we talk a lot about telehealth. But when uh, and with all this with all this was going on, we were trying to do telehealth with our patients, and it was very very hard. They didn't know how to do it. So as as providers, you have to take the time and understand your community, understand your patients, and help them out. If they didn't have an email, help them. Take a couple of second minutes and help them open an email. Teach them how to use telehealth. Um, so and make sure you create a partnership patient doctor partnership that's the most important thing thank you and last but certainly not least dr Dell. uh okay i want to focus on just a couple of things new yorkers and bronx people keep crushing the curve i'm going to say that again so important so important we're doing a great job so keep on it secondly Make sure the information you're acting on is reliable. I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but it's so important. If you have a question, talk to your physician or nurse practitioner about it. Listen to Don't Trump. Do everything you read on the internet, please. Do not Love listen people. to Trump. Do not listen to Trump. Uh, and, and then how about everybody on this, on this forum? decides to do one thing a little bit more or a little bit different than what they've been doing, whether it's going out and activating a friend or a colleague or a neighbor about voting or learning about the issues yourself or for white people, please, we need to do, it's a lifetime's work to understand how racism has threaded itself in an ugly, uh, meaningful, powerful, uh, sad way in our lives. So untangle that, we can make a pledge uh, to do that. Maybe it's being involved in the community garden cleanups and the park cleanups like the borough president. Choose one thing today, if you're at all inspired by what's going on, that you're going to do a little bit more and a little bit differently uh, and see how far you can take that because that's what's going to take uh, for all of us to do those one or two or three things a little bit differently and a little bit more. Um, and everyone stay healthy, stay well, stay safe. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that we, that's it. I mean, we abuse all of your time. Um, Nancy, do you have some parting words here? And I do. I wanted to say that uh, our IT maven extraordinaire uh, has said that this is on the uh, Bar President's YouTube channel. It can be seen at any time on demand. I think BronxNet will be rebroadcasting us on specific dates. And so we're very happy about that. Um, I also wanted to say that we have future topics, aside from, I'll let you thank everyone and have the last word, but we will be talking about food insecurity, mental health services, and the opioid crisis, and the equity work in contact tracing, and also telemedicine, and the digital divide between 
people who are poor and those who, who can see a doctor quite readily that way. So I mean, I think in terms of those topics, first of all, let me just say this. We've abused your time. We've been on two hours already. Uh, thank you to uh, Leslie Branch, Dr. Branch. Thank you for your input. You're a scholar. Um, yeah. and we appreciate your perspective. Uh, uh, Denise Nunez, se te quiere de gratis, the way I said before. I can't believe that you're out there in Florida, but I can't. I can't, but I can't believe because that's who you are. Dr. Bedell, you've been always, always a friend of mine and me, but more importantly, of the Bronx. And, you know, you, maybe you're not working in an official capacity anymore, but you certainly continue to work and do God's work for us here. We want to thank um, Dr. Barbeau for joining us. I want to thank all of the viewers that, and the people who have um, chimed in. I'm told that we've had hundreds, and you know, when you add up the different um, platforms. I want to thank my team, uh, Nancy, you, and Chris, and Alexis, the whole team, uh, Omar, Scheffler, and everybody else on the staff, even though we're not in the office, you've been working remotely, you've made me smart. Uh, these, uh, we, this is, again, hopefully something that I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you're consistent with either volunteering or pushing on a topic or a policy or speaking about um, a, a topic of conversation as a community, one conversation alone is not going to solve anything and it's not going to motivate much people. So I'm hoping that we get a lot of feedback. We're hoping that people will then chime in the next time so we can address some of the topics. For those of you out there, even though we know that the numbers are low, practice social distancing. Wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, and use your mask. And use the mask the right way, over the nose and under the chin. When you talk to somebody and you bring the mask down, when you're talking to them, you just defeated the whole purpose. The mask is not necessarily going to um, protect you from getting COVID, but what it does is since we don't know who is positive and you could be asymptomatic, we know that if everyone covers themselves, that then you stop maybe perhaps from giving somebody else COVID, and if they have it, they can stop you, and it works. It is the reason. This is an enemy we can't see, we can't smell, we don't know where it's at, we don't have we, we don't have a treatment, we don't have a vaccine, and yet, how did we get our numbers down? Because when the time came here in New York and in New York City, after we suffered and weathered the, the, the terrible storm, people started adhering to wearing a mask. What we're seeing now where people are getting too comfortable, you don't want a second wave. Look at what's happening in other states, because they are not adhering to social distancing ordinances there. So with that said, thank you all. Stay safe. God bless you all, and God bless the Bronx.